The Realm Tree Episode 9 Fear and Fire A fiery distress call in the distance. Nadine and I took off running towards Lex's position, but she was having trouble keeping up with me. This better be something urgent and not just that his pants need ironing. Lex is a snob, but he's not stupid. How long until we get to him? (sighs) Twenty minutes if we keep this pace. But I'm going to need to slow down soon. Running is not my expertise. All right. I'm going to carry you. What? That's pointless. I'm going to get my squirrel thing to merge with me again and use that extra speed and strength to get us both there. You want to test my new powers, right? Now's the time. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Just carry me already. On the condition that you don't tell anyone about my magical animal friend. Are you really doing this right now? Let me be the one to tell them. Fine. You win. Thanks, Nadine. I tried to recreate that feeling of fear when I fell. Lex in danger. Lex being hurt. Not getting there in time to save Lex. I felt the beast clamor onto my shoulder and sink into my back. On my next inhale, I was stronger again. From my gear, I pulled a small blanket around myself like a cloak to hide the line of jewels. I stopped myself in front of Nadine and let her climb onto me. Energy pulsing through my body, I charged forward through the field in a burst of speed, dark steam coming off of me as I ran. You know, if you did this all the time, it would speed up travel. We should make this a recurring thing. What is it with you and Lex not wanting to walk on your own? He's lazy. I'm thinking of what's optimal. That's the difference. As we dashed through the sunlight over to the signal, we saw a massive figure before we saw our friend. It was like a giant snow statue had come to life, maybe five or six times taller than Lex, who was dodging out of the way of its massive limbs, attempting to step on him. Oh, hello! Please help! One of Lex's wisps was still forming the distress call just above the snow giant. Daisy and Rondell weren't here yet. It's made of snow. That's a clear elemental weakness. Talia, let me down. I did as she asked. Nadine drew a cube from her bag and held it back to throw. I'll hit it with a fireball cube without the explosion. It shouldn't be necessary. Wait, don't! The cube Nadine tossed dissolved to unleash a fireball, but then the snow from the giant started to spiral off of its body, becoming a whip-like stream of water. In a swirling motion, it doused Nadine's fireball before reintegrating itself with the main body. Hmm, that was my last fire cube. Bummer. Oh, come on, use that big brain of yours. If this thing could be melted with fire, I would have done so already. Lex narrowly dodged a fist that attempted to crush him. So the giant integrates both snow and water into its construction and manipulates both freely. That's very unusual, but certainly effective. Now is not the time for- Ah! A massive stone hand grabbed Lex and began lifting him up to eye level, high above the ground. Lex! Where are you? Whoa, what the hell is that thing? Daisy and Rondell were visible in the distance, but neither of them would make it here fast enough. Hey, Nadine? Yes? Experiment time. I'm about to test how high I can jump with these powers. You do whatever you can to hurt it while I'm up there. Hold hold on, this is beyond reckless. I started charging up a jump while she was talking. My legs propelled off the ground with intense force. I could see the trails of steam and dark energy coming off of me as I shot upwards at the giant. In the distance, I saw Daisy stop in her tracks. Whoa! What?! I jammed my harpoon into the giant's shoulder. My feet kicked freely in the air, failing to find a foothold in its snowy arm. I swung myself side to side until I had enough momentum to fling myself up onto it. I yanked my harpoon out and stood level with the giant's head. Lex struggled to get out of its grip, stared down by its unmoving and stoic face. Oh! 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 Is that you, Talia? Now, how did you get up here? Lex, do you still have any control of your wisp making the distress signal? Why, yes. Yes, I do. Attack the giant. It'll just put it out with another water stream. I saw the giant's hand start to squeeze. Oh, fine! The wisp making letters in the air dive bombed the giant's head. From its back, another tendril of water whipped out to douse it. Permafrost! The water whip turned to solid ice, breaking off from the giant and falling to the ground. I glanced briefly below us, seeing Nadine with her hands raised. I had a feeling turning water into ice would be simple for her. I'm glad she caught on. This left Lex's wisp free to dive into the giant, melting its snowy head, its stern face becoming droopy. Its grip on him began to loosen. Oh dear. (gasps) Lex fell out of its grip and began to fall, bits of slush coming off along with him. Without thinking, harpoon in hand, I charged up a jump and propelled myself to him as he fell. 
Gotcha. I caught him with my free hand. Wind cube incoming. Release. A gust of wind caught Lex and I as we fell, slowing our descent and landing in front of Nadine. He released himself from my grasp. <sighs> you have some explaining to do. Later. Here's the plan. Lex, you keep attacking it with fire. Nadine, you freeze any of those water attacks it tries to use to stop him. I'll be on defense and carry you out of harm's way. I turned to see Rondell and Daisy were attacking its ankles. Rondell was holding a piece of shattered ice that fell off the giant. He swung it around with both hands like a club at the giant's ankle. Ugh, you're not getting this back! Daisy punched into the snow of the giant's other foot. A watery tentacle whipped from around the ankle, knocking her to the ground, but she got right back up. They already have the right idea. Help them out. Lex summoned three wisps that combined into a larger one, the biggest one I've seen yet. Instead of using his elegant conducting motions, he had to swing both arms wildly just to send it forward. An arm made of water burst out of the giant's chest and attempted to grab Lex's fireball. Again, permafrost! Her eyes slowed the arm to a halt and the wisp flew past it, melting a hole where the giant's heart would be. The fireball shrunk from the watery snow, but it was large enough to come back around for a second trip. It barreled through the giant's bicep, severing the arm and dropping it to the ground. It fell down towards Daisy. In a burst of speed, I tackled my friend out of the way, pulling her into my chest and spinning in the air so I skidded onto the grassy ground instead of her. She sat up and grabbed me by the shoulders. Talia, what? What is happening? Your eyes are glowing. How are you so fast? Later, I'll explain later. I pushed her off me and stood up quickly to survey the damage. Lex blasted another hole through the giant. It was clear he was slowing down. Water poured off of it and snow fell off in chunks. We're doing it! Ugh, oh, it's all melty now. At its center, I thought I saw something. The giant stopped moving. With a shattering sound, its snowy form completely changed to water. A liquid, armless colossus for just a moment before bubbling into a massive sphere of water. And at its center, a porcelain orb of ice about twice the size of a fairy. It's changed shape. Thank you, I can see that. I have no way of damaging something completely made of water. It's not completely made of water. There's an icy core in the center. I have a feeling that's the key to us winning. I might be able to throw some Someone into there to get at it. No, I got this on my own. Oh, sure, yeah. I took a deep breath and held it, focusing all my energy into my legs. Shadows spiraled off of the ground where I stood. <laughs> a stronger jump than I had ever done before. I kicked off the ground like a cannonball, wind rushing by, blasting straight into the watery sphere. The impact felt like it should hurt, but I felt fine and held my breath. I pushed against the water resistance to the core. Up close, I could see it wasn't a perfect orb. It was rough and jagged. I grabbed onto a stray icicle with one hand and pulled my harpoon back with the other. With all of the strength I could muster, dark energy pounding through my veins, I drove it into the sphere. A cry of pain from within the core and it dissolved. My harpoon had stabbed into the side of a fairy boy with a dark jacket and snow white hair. His blood drifted into the water. We floated together and his eyes met mine. It was Malthus Frost, the boy's sunshine knocked out of the test during the tournament. The water began to dissipate, falling onto the grassy field in a torrential splash. I yanked my harpoon out of Malthus' side. Still holding his breath, he struggled not to cry out and swallow water. One more time. Permafrost! Nadine froze a ramp below us from the falling water. We slid down the rest of the way, safely to the ground. You can make that much ice? Only when there's already a lot of water. And I have to yell to get the right energy. I don't like yelling. Water splashed all over the field around us. Malthus tried to crawl away, but I grabbed him tightly by the <clears throat> collar. Okay, 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 look. You already stabbed me. I, I can see it won't be easy to walk away from this one. You won't be walking away at all. The rest of the team gathered around us as I pinned Malthus on the ground. <clears throat> Talia, where did those powers- Your mouth is frost. Why are you here? You're the bloke Sunshine knocked out of the tournament. Wait, how are you in the tree if you failed the first round? I'll tell you everything if you get your crazy friend not to stab me again. Deal. I stood up. He did too. Slower, with his hands raised. Look, I'm a smart guy. I know when I've lost. Talia, you look a little roughed up. Do you need some help I'm with- I'm fine. Oh, okay. We were mad we got knocked out of the test so early, just because of who we got paired up with. Huh? What do you mean, we? Me, Ernest, and Aquamarine. Hey- Ernest is the guy I beat. And I beat Aquamarine. I remembered her perfect blue-green hair, her attempt to break me against a wall, and the mascara running down her face when she was knocked out of the test. Yeah, 
But we broke into the test. We were gonna go up all secret like, reach the top of the tree and get our wings anyway. It was stupid that we were knocked out so quickly. And why did you attack Lex? I held my harpoon to his throat. <laughs> Easy, I'm cooperating. We've been working with some other folks, and they wanted us to test out something. Malthus turned around slowly. Permission to take off my jacket? Fine. Quickly. Malthus pulled his leather jacket off. In the center of his back, in addition to his white jewel, was another white one crudely sewn into his skin below it. The skin around the two jewels was red. That's a brutal wound. But it's worth it, huh? I've never created a snow soldier that big before. And where exactly did you get those other jewels? Isn't it obvious? Other fairies. We all fell silent before Malthus piped up again. Whoa! Whoa, whoa, I don't, I don't know that for sure. The other fairies me, Ernest, and Aquamarine are working with just performed an operation on us. We, we went under totally asleep, and we woke up with these extra jewels embedded into us. I didn't kill anyone, I, I promise. But I was told I could keep it if I proved I could use it. By killing me? Wounding! I was gonna wound, that's all. Everyone, calm down. You have no right to tell us to calm down. Hey, Talia. Oh, what? What do you want, Daisy? Sorry, sorry. I was just gonna ask, where's Mercury? We looked around us. He never came. I have an eye for the suspicious. I can see things that stand out even when they try to blend into the background. And I could tell there was something very wrong with this picturesque field of grass and hills. Or rather... It's emptiness. I counted eight teams of six at the start of the test. Sunshine and Hazel's team are the only ones we've encountered so far, after several days of travel. There are a limited number of pathways up, less than the others realize. On some nights, as my team slept, I would tell my watch partner to rest while I handled the lookout. And instead, I would scout the paths we ignored. And they all seemed to lead to this field. We all began the test at the same time, we should have encountered more fairies by now. This morning, I told Lex and Rondell I was going to search the west end of the field and that I would be back soon. Lex was sketching the morning light on the field in pencil, and Rondell was switching between different variations of push-ups. Sure, mate. Come back alive and all that. Bring me back! Something nice! I was envious of the way they lived their lives without suspicion. Perhaps they never needed to. The term for what I am is a luxomancer. I manipulate light energy. By concentrating it into a physical form, I can create my blades, and that's how I fight. But I can also use my power for movement. With immense precision, I can convert my own body into light energy. With it, I can cross rooms in the blink of an eye. But it's dangerous. Any more than a fraction of a millisecond and my body itself could lose its solid composition and completely disintegrate, erasing my body and mind from this existence. Overuse increases that risk. As does losing my nerve, but it's a good start to a full sprint across this field. I felt the very atoms in my skin rush through space. As familiar as the feeling was, it was always terrifying. As my body stabilized, I used the momentum to carry myself into a run. Every few minutes of running, when I felt calm enough to handle my own power, I would burst forwards in a blur of light again. I know that parts of the tree were not natural, its many environments created artificially by fairies and magic as we climbed level by level. But I couldn't understand the purpose of this place. It slowed us down with no other challenge. Could it have existed in the tree before? That's when I noticed what looked like a large foxhole in the ground, partially obscured by a hill. There were insects and the occasional bird or mammal within the tree, but nothing that could create a hole in the ground this large. Might as well investigate. I created a sort of light to illuminate the tunnel underground. It revealed a dirt passageway barely large enough for me to fit through. Less than a minute of walking down a steep slant and I was met with a circular den of some sort, no larger than an average bedroom. The ceiling of the den was double my height. Now this is where I'm getting suspicious. We saw that giant owl, so I knew that massive animals aren't irregular for a place like this, but based on the size of this tunnel, a sizable creature wouldn't be comfortable here, and it would have gone deeper or created a larger nest for itself. I cautiously poked at the dirt floor with my sword. It seemed solid. Then I ran my hand along the wall. It seemed solid as well. Now what's the least likely place for someone investigating a room to check? In my free hand, I created an arrow of light. I threw it like a dart at the ceiling. It passed straight through. There was a round, fairy-sized hole in the ceiling. 
hidden by some sort of illusion. Likely day, night, or autumn realm magic. Should I tell the others before I go further? I guess we can't all be cool lone wolves like you, huh? No. I would be fine. I dispersed my sword, crouched, and took a full jump. I narrowly grabbed onto a ledge hidden by the illusion. It looked like my hands were passing through the solid surface, reminding me of Rondell. I hoisted myself up into a passageway made of thick, thread-like weavings. Other than the strange material, it was like the air ducts of a building hidden in the ceiling of this place made to look like an animal den. This was not natural. Is this how the council monitors us, or something else? I had to crawl. I lit up my hands with light magic so I could see through the darkness again. Eventually, my hands found a hole downwards into another passageway. I cautiously dropped downwards into a larger woven tunnel. Lighting the passageway were glowing mushrooms that emitted a dim green shimmer. I carefully placed my hand on the material in the wall. It reminded me of a spider's nest, interwoven to create tunnels under the field, maybe throughout the whole tree. Nobody else seemed to be present. My light was no longer necessary in the glow of the plant life, so I shut it off. I strafed carefully around each corner. Eventually, I found what seemed to be a dead end, but there was a wooden chest with a metal lock sitting against the web-like wall, lit faintly by the green light. And luckily, I knew how to make a key. I robbed a store or two in my time. It's usually hard to maintain a complicated physical form out of light energy. It wants to move in every direction as quickly as possible. The double-bladed swords I created when fighting Hazel is the most complicated design I have right now. But there are ways to circumvent the difficulty of creating complex forms. I gathered light energy within my hands to create a flash. As it grew, I pressed the light into the lock with my palm. Using the lock itself as a mold, the flash of light made a perfect key out of the glowing energy. I twisted it within the lock. With a click, I had opened the chest. I carefully opened it. The passageway was dark, but I could make out faint traces of solid objects hidden away. A treasure that was meant to be secret. I lit up my palms for a closer look, and I felt my heart jump at what I saw. Jewels! About a dozen jewels, scattered carelessly in the confines of the chest. Some were cracked, some were in pieces. Some still had marks of blood from the fairies' backs they must have been ripped from. Now, how did you get in here, friend? <laughs> I turned around to see a teenage fairy with green eyes and dirty blonde hair. He smiled warmly. How did I not hear him? From his hand, he blew a strange dust into my face. <sighs> my limbs started to go slack. I struggled to stay conscious, my eyelids heavier than I could stand. Callum Thorn. I remembered his name. He was in the tournament, but my mind wouldn't go any further. Everything was shutting off as I slumped to the ground, my knees hitting the woven floor first. The last thing I heard was the boy's voice. Nighty night, Mercury Chase. <laughs> The Realm Tree was created by Jamar Thompson and Julian Hermano, and is performed by voice artists all over the world. To show your support, please visit therealmtree.com and follow our socials. Thank you for listening, and tune in next time for Episode 10, Games in the Dark. <laughs>